How's it going, everyone? Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to uh, hop on this call today. Uh, we'll wait a couple of seconds for um, people to trickle in, um, but um, thank you so much um, for uh, having me over for uh, this, this talk here. Um, and in a couple of seconds, we'll be uh, right around now. Um, cool. Um, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started then. Um, welcome. Um, I'm Brian, um, a product director over at Rudderstack, and today I want to talk about something that's not necessarily my company, but like the experience leading up to um, kind of joining Rudderstack here, and that is around architecting tools and teams for data governance um, and lessons for data governance um, in scaling organizations. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in the space for a little over eight years now. Um, started out over at Dropbox working on their Hadoop and Hive ecosystem, doing product for internal, internal data infrastructure. Um, for those of you who remember, uh, those are the days before the modern data stack, before the pre, I guess, before the um, a number of these applications have really made it so much easier to get started. Hadoop and F Hive were just a fun, a fun ecosystem uh, to kind of get these organizations exposed to big data and uh, learned a lot about the challenges at the um, at the early stages there. Um, over at Dropbox, we were really built a lot of internal tools, built nearly all of the modern data stacks in in house. Um, and that was a great uh, way to learn about like uh, what people are looking for and how to build it out of first principles. After that, I moved over to DoorDash, um, worked on the broader data platform, expanded not just towards like warehousing and ETL, but also towards experimentation, A-B testing, infrastructure, streaming through uh, our, our Kafka ecosystem, some basic ML around like feature stores and like feature predictions. Um, our BI team around our dashboarding and our like, I guess like data accessibility across the broader organization. And finally, like our privacy programs, especially as uh, CCPA and GDPR became increasingly prevalent in the or in, uh, across the world. Um, and today I'm over at Rudderstack, a director of product, building our warehouse first customer data platform. Um, that's basically building a lot of, going back to some of the roots, building event streams, extracts from first party and third party systems, as well as reverse ETL, being able to activate the data um, into these downstream systems. So kind of have been in this data ecosystem for a while and want to quickly go through some of the learnings we've had around data governance and hopefully some of it is useful to you. Oops, sorry, move on. Um, but yeah, I think like, uh, just even before we get started on these slides, like we have, I'm sure we have a variety of people in this call, uh, whether it be, uh, whether you're working on data engineering systems, whether you're on BI, whether on data governance. And so kind of like, hopefully this is a little bit for any of you. If you're a data engineer and you're in charge of data governance, hopefully this is useful for you. If you're on data infrastructure um, and you work adjacent to your data governance teams, um, hopefully this helps you build some empathy on what they're going through and how you can actually help them run their programs. Um, and if you're kind of like a data exec that's trying to understand data more broadly, this is a similar context for you. And really the, what this slide is saying is like data governance is hard, especially because it means different things to different people. Um, it may mean something different for a compliance person, a security person, a BI person on the engineering side, um, or even kind of like your operational analytics or operational teams. But if you can break down each of these challenges, I think like you can really create a strategy to build a great data program um, and kind of be able to break down the pro challenges that where things, uh, different things to different people actually make things confusing. And really, if we think about like why governance is hard, uh, this is this little line that we've drawn right here. On the left side, you have teams that are saying, we need to lock down data access to limit security exposure and compliance risk. Um, and on the right side, we have some the complete opposite direction, which is operational teams saying, our team needs more, more access to data to make better business and product decisions. So you can already see the tension stretching on like, wh what are you trying to achieve in data governance? Even just to add on to that, um, there's, 
you're not just stretched in kind of like two dimensions, but multiple areas. So on the left, we have a more, more arguments on restricting access. We need to restrict access because it's too dangerous to have people making decisions on data they don't understand. Or uh, employees are costing us thousands of dollars on bad queries because they don't know the best practices. And then on the right side, you have situations where marketing teams say our customers respond better to personalized communications and we need more democratized customer data in order to personalize better. Or um, from a bureaucratic perspective, you can say it took my analyst uh, two weeks to get access to the data they needed. Um, and by the time they even got access, the an analysis was no longer relevant. So you can, as a data governance person, you, um, you, or whoever is in the charge of data governance gets to sit in the middle, kind of being able trying to manage these two pulling, uh, these two, this tug of war that's happening on both sides. And that's scary. I think like there's lots of fires go on. You can imagine fires from both sides playing the meet middleman, the communicator, trying to be able to manage all of this. That's scary. And hopefully I want to go through some slides here of how we try to deal with this ideas of how we can make this like uh, our lives better and be able to create this program that works. Um, and yeah, I think like, I th if you can really find this balance, um, I came up with a sentence that I think incorporates like how, what a good program is. It's a little bit wordy, um, you can iterate on it, but it's your goal as a data engineer or like a data governance person or somebody in charge of governance is to Enable powered with data, um, but with well understood and agreed upon risk. You're never going to go one way or the other. You're never going to kind of like, it's not just like freedom versus, I don't know, control or something like that, but being able to find that balance, being able to empower them and be able to kind of like make sure that others understand what your strategy is or what's going on is huge. Um, and that's kind of like what allows them, allows you to draw that middle ground. Um, and just jumping right in, what does that mean? What does it mean to break down these challenges? And like, I think like there's, you know, there's a large ecosystem for data governance broadly, but a couple of questions that we can answer today are like, who has access to the data? What is the data that's being generated? Where does the data live? Why are people spending so much and like costing the company thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars? And like, what are the, when are the regulations relevant to me? Um, and finally, like, how do I manage all of this? How do I manage this tug of war? And go through each of them really quickly, one at a time. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask, or I think like maybe in the Q and A, uh, we can try to be able to like uh, talk through some of these um, uh, questions at the end, hopefully. Um, real question, who has, who has access to the data um, and what data they have access to? Pretty important question. Um, pretty high level, uh, security, authentication and authorization are pretty big in the security space. This is the data equivalent. Um, and like even before we start, kind of like why do we even care about who has access? And at a high level, the security teams care because like having a large number of people who have access to the data beyond their business needs increases the probability of data leaks. Um, I, I don't know, there's some screenshots here about like situations where uh, there's also insider trading um, because people have access to business data or just individual abuse of data. If your CS team or some other teams are able to like look into a service that like an Airbnb or a DoorDash order that somebody has, or even see their address. Like um, if, if you want to be able to like see uh, St St Stephen Curry's address or something like that, that's something that is actually should be very, is private and should be very private and is very important in data controls. Um, and this isn't a problem that just lives in isolation. Who has access then gets tied to, and what they have access to gets tied to like what data is in the system, what teams do people belong to, and like what are teams even trying to do with the data? How do you set good defaults for getting that access? Um, and the easiest way I think like is just a clear framework where you just start by categorizing the type of sensitive data that I have in the system. Um, there's operations and product data, there's customer PII, there's financial data, HR data, and then kind of mapping that to the teams that actually need this information. This seems like a little bit of a no brainer, but this is a pretty useful exercise to run early on and at least like iterate on. You might not know the entirety of all the company's data on the very start, but you can ask your security teams, ask your compliance teams, which types of data actually matter to bring controls into. Um, 
and kind of just like create some defaults. One thing that we did over at both DoorDash and Dropbox was we integrated these defaults with the LDAP systems. So LDAP systems had teams, had group permissions, and we were able to tie these group permissions to access at the data warehouse level, either the Hadoop Hive level or the Snowflake level um, at DoorDash and be able to make sure that like early on, only a certain number of teams had different, like a matrix of permissions um, to these uh, to these different types of data. Um, and so that involves a classification tool um, like Big ID or something like that. It involves the LDAP system. And finally, it involves maybe some kind of like a process of ex ex exceptions as well. I mentioned earlier, sometimes an analyst spends two weeks like asking for data for that that they should have had permissions to having a clear exception process where the compli oftentimes the compliance team, um, not not the data team who doesn't have as much context on this data, or um, will be the one that like can grant exceptions uh, via some internal tooling to be able to uh, lubricate these process a little bit more. Um, so building, <clears throat> giving people the right access is just number one. Um, one thing that we learned with um, both these companies is one thing to consider is like not all PIOs created equal. Um, there's some email address is something that's kind of like widely available on the red, but is probably a very different risk profile than say biometric data or physical addresses. Um, or phone numbers. And also if you're a B2B or a combination of a B2B, B2C business, customer business information or the person you're selling to, like um, a business owner might be treated differently from a uh, end user or a customer who's actually using your product. Um, and similarly, PI access was not, like not a funnel. That's one thing we learned. We had started out in some of these systems building like a restricted PII and then super restricted PII and super, super restricted PII for different levels. But we realized really quickly that it's not like some are more restricted than others in a funnel way. It's more of like a matrix where sales PI and product PI were completely different flavors of types of data and create, we were creating, able to create a matrix based off that similar to the one I uh, showed earlier. Uh, moving on to kind of another one, which is like, what is the data being generated? Um, how do we make sure that the data we generate is good? This is much more of a data engineering thing. So I'll quickly run through some of this. Um, I love this diagram. This is um, from Jason Horowitz's Emerging Architectures in Modern Data Infrastructure. Every person who's like worked in data infrastructure has drawn some similar kind of diagram. Um, and so, but since this one's public, one use it. And like, if we think about like, out of all this modern data stack, one of the things that's important is like, what, what are your sources of data? And like, kind of how can they change? And we zoom into these sources of data, we see like there's OLTP, ERPs, operational apps, event collectors, blah, blah, blah. And there's a number of these where like, actually, if you zone in on it, they're, they become high, like medium high risk profile if you don't really think about what, how the data is coming in. Um, for example, for OLTP databases, if product teams are building new features and updating data schemas, um then that can that can mess with your that can like mess with your bi processes um for or for event collectors different product teams tend to use different tracking schemas because there's a lack of standards and consequence and this is something that you like there are technological solutions but there's also a number of policy and process solutions where you kind of like can bring power back into the data engineering teams um to be able to kind of make sure that these don't affect you downstream this is a hybrid data engineering governance problem um, just to give a quick example of what this means, uh, just say, let's think of a simple feature where like you want to, you're a social app and you want to be able to split first name and last name to support like for last name search or kind of like um, some kind of grouping by last name or something like that. Um, but a simple feature just like this, the old schema might be user ID, email, and the full name, but your new schema all of a sudden includes the first name, the last name, and maybe a name deprecated column just to make sure that the existing BI processes that used this old column have some way to uh, have a temporary, uh, temporary fix before they get it fixed. But what this means is analytics teams have to update the ETL jobs, data dictionaries have to update to which columns are the source of truth. You can no longer use name deprecated, please use the other ones. Dashboards have to update if they're using the old columns. Compliance teams now have to tag not just one, but all of a sudden three of these columns are PII, first name, last name, and the name deprecated. And um, yeah, this deprecated column is like an additional kind of like uh, gotcha or semantic. Um, and finally, just the last thing is like, oftentimes this happens without people realizing. Everything breaks, 
um, and people are in a scramble for something as simple as just splitting a first na uh, name into a first name and a last name. Um, so if you're on the governance team, on the data engineering team, if you can do this before everything breaks, that's that's awesome, right? And one way to do it was to get into the product and tech reviews. Product managers have PRDs, tech reviews have RFCs. Having a section on how data gets impacted helps you kind of get ahead of these problems. Not perfect, but it goes a long way. Um, similarly, um, for tracking, that's another challenge that uh, happens where product teams, um, for event tracking where data is not persisted, data is not in a transactional database, but you wanna see how people are kind of navigating through the app or if you're in YouTube pressing play and pause and stuff like that. Um, that's difficult because product teams often sometimes use different tracking schemas because lack of standards and consequence. So you can imagine a world where the iOS team and the Android team don't talk or a world where uh, if you have multiple e-commerce brands, their e-commerce brands don't talk. So one thing you have is a product purchased and then somebody has purchased product and all of a sudden it's down to the data teams to deal with this. Um, and there's a number of tools out there, including ours that have like this new concept, something called tracking plans. Um, and aside from kind of like the high level of a tracking plan being a checklist that you check against, uh, if you're using Kafka, it'd be a schema registry. If you're using an application, it'd be a tracking plan. Um, checking that the schemas and the data types match. There's a little bit more high level nuance that you can start thinking of as you implement these. Um, for example, um, where do you actually do the validation? Do you do it at the development level? Do you do it on the client before it sends to the server? Or do you actually do it on the server side validation? All of these have their pros and cons. Um, ultimately, I think like when we build our app, we are building on server side validation because it does serve as a centralized checkpoint for up, all updates. And client side, sometimes you can you might have like performance reduction in your app if you're actually running these processes and pre-blocking them on the client. Um, development validation sounds very interesting. We have seen a number of companies that integrate tracking plan enforcement into their CI CD. That's super cool. Um, but if you're trying to have individual developers integrated to their PyCharm or some IDE, it requires adoption and the price of having like a schema tracking plan that's 90% there is very costly for a developer's like time and sanity. Um, but these are different, the pros and cons to all of this and definitely things to think about as you like build out your program. Um, the third thing here is like kind of like, where does the data live? Um, I think data dictionaries is the big thing. Don't have too much here, but I think like when you think of where does the data live, it's actually the backbone for a lot of the other things we're gonna talk about today the cost and the schema management um, and lineage and all of that is very useful for democratizing access uh, in a way that makes sense for your data program. Um, and it's just a quick kind of like overview of how I'm thinking about it. Data dictionaries help, can help drive organizational visibility. But more recently, there's been a bit of a move towards like metrics where uh, if you're exposing kind of like the raw data is not as useful as exposing kind of like semantic meaning on top. I know there's been a number of efforts, including like LookML and stuff over time to be able to do this metrics layer. But this is something that is uh, increasingly interesting um, because this helps kind of like from a governance slash like dictionary slash cataloging perspective helps people understand what is the data um, in a way that's useful. Um, this fourth one is, next one is kind of, uh, something that hits pretty close to home, which is like, why are people spending so much um, and managing costs? Uh, definitely got this uh, pretty recently and uh, got a couple of nods from some people I've talked to, which is like, you have a situation where your CFO isn't happy that your bill for data infrastructure and applications is 50% uh, over your annual budget, whether it be your streaming apps, your warehousing, your ETL processes, your transformations, all of that. Um, and or in your BI tools, it goes to NVP, somehow passes to the data team, which you might be on, and then somehow like becomes a data governance problem because too many people are using data resources. It's like, we need better governance. We better, need better rules on this. Um, and now, now it's a data governance problem. And a couple of ways of thinking about this um, are like, just kind of like tackling cost as like a, uh, 
a part of governance actually kind of starts to make sense when you start thinking about it. If you identify the situation, you have a couple of things that generate costs, which is like how people are interacting with your data ecosystem, whether it be generating data, transforming data, storing data, querying data, exporting data, kind of like things that have been around forever. Um, but then it helps us kind of think about your leverage that you have as a data engineering or a data governance team. Um, retention policy helps reduce the, how much your data you're storing. Ownership helps um, kind of like actually go to the next stage, which is building a single source of truth to minimize uh, redundant transformations or redundant data generation. Cleaning up stale processes is also something empowered by ownership, where um, if you have processes that are no longer relevant to the organization, audiences you're building that are not true anymore, um, that helps you kind of like be able to be more efficient and more streamlined. And finally, just simple awareness of how much your task costs, both from the owner's perspective as well as your individual users. Oftentimes individual users fire off queries, do stuff without really knowing the impact of the work or kind of like how much they're costing. It's like kind of like plugging something into electricity, hoping the appliance um, it doesn't cost too much. Um, most of the time it doesn't, but sometimes when you're going down these initiatives, uh, things do become challenging. And finally, you can start tuning your parameters. Like once you have your toolkit, then you can start going out to the multiple teams that you work with to determine like which ones are acceptable, which ones work. Um, and one lesson that I learned from uh, like the previous companies is like, if you kind of just go out there without talking to the teams and you kind of just like think about the first principles, you lose a lot. You lose some reason why an analytics team might have a need for data that's older than one year. Um, and if you go out saying, hey, we're deleting all data older than one year, you create strife. And so work, being able to work with analytics teams was like really useful. Um, in kind of understanding which tables need a retention policy, which ones didn't, how to build kind of product or product features around a meaningful retention policy that was able to save us money, but also allow people to do the financial analytics that they needed for um, other reasons. Um, another one is just to kind of like build these single sources of truth. Go out there, say like, this is our user table. This is the table that matters. Everything like if either you funnel into this or you don't. Um, and if for stuff where you're building kind of like derivatives or kind of like we, uh, weird stuff, trying to be able to corral that in so people aren't building multiple sources of truth, both um, generating confusion, but also kind of like multiple expensive processes. Um, and so last thing that might be an interesting idea um, if cost is an issue to you is to build some like cost awareness or like pseudo billing systems for team spend. Going a little bit too aggressive might be, uh, is a little bit dangerous territory because the people who are effectively using the system might not have the levers or might not have the control to actually uh, be able to lobby for more or kind of appeal their situation. And um, that's, that's kind of a tough thing to manage, but building some basic awareness systems or at least like letting the managers know, letting the directors know kind of their departmental spend at a high level it allows them to engage in initiatives um, that help them be a little bit more efficient with how they use data. One thing that's really interesting, this last line here is like cost reduction and governance initiatives actually have like a pretty high overlap, whether it be ownership, whether it be building a single source of truth, whether it be building retention policy for compliance reasons, so like a lot of these things kind of like double up. It's like you never really want to be too aggressive doing two birds with one stone, but being able to kind of like double up on these initiatives kind of gives you multiple stakeholders that are invested in these things that you're trying to build. Um, and that's always like, uh, that provides both backup as well as firepower for being able to apply, build these governance programs. Um, this fifth one, I guess, is like uh, moving on to this fifth one. I think we have about five or so minutes left. Um, why, a couple of when, when to follow regulations. A bit of, I try to do a who, what, where, why, when, and this is a bit of a um, round peg in a square hole. But compliance isn't just a legal problem. It's an anyone, everyone's problem. There's multiple reasons. It's a security problem. It's an analytical problem. It's a cost problem. Um, and so really quick uh, note on regulations here. Um, there's a couple, one that's just really close to data governance right now. There's GDPR, CCPA, a number of laws that are passing around in Virginia, Washington, um, Japan, and some other kind of like nations around the world around data privacy, given various types of laxness and uh, versus strictness. And I think our policy over at DoorDash was we built for 
mostly for the strictest version of the law and kind of like we're operating under the assumption that this is what we're going to operate under. GDPR, CCPA are going to be probably some of the strictest ones out there. Um, and the rest of them kind of like fall under, don't have to think about them separately because they are subsets uh, and derivatives of these uh, root data privacy laws where um, gives you some, gives the consumer some permission, uh, how do you say, rights around data privacy. But other ones that might be interesting to you, SOX compliance, financial uh, teams care about this, very important around permission management, SOC 2, HIPAA, ISO 2000, uh, 2701. Um, all of these are kind of like important things that might be adjacent to data governance and need to be on your radar as you think about how to build these programs. Um, similarly, just to drive in the point that it's kind of like everyone's problem. Um, these are kind of like the teams that we think about every time when we're building our, our um, CCPA GDPR program. Um, just a quick TLD on the right side. Uh, these uh, privacy laws give consumers the right to access information about them, right? To delete the information from a, comp a company servers, um, gives them a right. There's some data residency rules, data retention policies, and kind of employee access to PI are all under this like data privacy umbrella. And that affects a number of teams. Um, legal teams have the ob obligation of minimizing risk for the organization, which these laws come up with big penalties. Engineering teams have to change the infrastructure. I miss sorry, compliance teams are ensured, like talking to regulators at that their company is compliant. Analytics teams may need access to sensitive data, so you need to have specific permissions for them. Sales teams, this one's really interesting actually, are increasingly being asked about companies' data privacy practices as a requirement for deals. So if you're like a company um, trying to sell B2B SaaS, you're going to be asked like, what are your data privacy practices? How can I ensure that like your employees are not looking at our data when you actually uh, give us that service? Um, and finally, marketing teams, similar to analytic teams, want to use this data, but having like a clear set of policies around the usage is like absolutely critical to um, building this good program. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's a lot and that's just the beginning, right? That's five out of probably like a dozen, a hundred things that are part of data governance. I'm sure like if this is a field you work in, there's a lot more. Um, but really quickly, I think this is a couple of points I wanna make here, which is one is like, you don't have to do it all yourself. These, all these cross-functional partners are there to help you. They're there to drive their own, uh, how do you say, goals. And oftentimes their goals will align with their, your, yours. And what you can do is take advantage of that. To, um, oh, sorry, that was C really. Cause like once you build a framework um, that others can understand and help you with, the teams can know how to push their agendas. A sales team can push their agenda and say like, I need privacy rules because I can't sell deals. Compliance team will say this, a security team will say that. Let the teams push their agendas, be their own mouthpieces. You don't have to be a mouthpiece for each of these teams. Um, and you will kind of learn as you put these teams together. Um, and second one is kind of like thinking of a bit of a grid of like, who are the teams you're actually working with? I had the last one of like, what regulations are relevant to me, but like who has access? What is the data? Where does the data live? A number of different teams get involved. And this, you can really kind of turn this almost into a grid of there's like teams that have both a mix of passive and active involvement into each of these problems. Uh, so for example, security and compliance are active engaged in access management, but whatever policies you build eventually have impacts on a number of different teams. And so kind of if you build this grid for yourselves and are able to kind of re realize who, are, think about who are the leaders that you need to talk to to make this happen, um, this is a great framework for thinking about uh, how to build that program. Um, build trust with your stakeholders. I think looking at this one and they reward you. I think that's the big one. Love them, build trust with them. And I think this this is how you build this kind of like get yeah, this get these two sides all all these sides all working um, and getting aligned on the same problem. Um, but I think just to cap on that, just moving to this slide, I think like just this is back to the first slide, which is data governance is hard. It means different things to different people. And if you can break the down the challenges, break down that grid. I think you can really build like a great data program, regardless of your data engineering or data governance. I'm super excited for all of you who are like here to listen to this and kind of like hopefully take something out of this, can bring it back to your teams. Um, but thank you so much for uh, coming to this talk and like you can uh, reach me at Brian at Rudderstack um, about anything here. Um, thank you so much.
I think we're at time. Cool. I'm going to stop the broadcast. Hope you guys are all enjoying your uh, session um, and allow you to kind of hop over to the next ones. I'll sign off. See you, everybody.